All right. So this is sort of half best practices talk, half incoherent rant. Uh, this is a sort of developer preview of what will ideally turn into a talk that's polished and pleasant. But when I said, what do you want me to talk about, the answer was mostly best practices. So here we go. Uh, so the best practices of the cloud in 2015 are dead. And if that's what you're following, it's really your own fault. That's not my quote, that's Amazon's quote, or at least it's what they're sort of expressing with everything that they wind up saying. Every 18 months, it seems, whatever you've started building out, oh, that's the way it used to be done, now we're not doing that anymore. Anyone who's gone from an EC2 classic to a VPC migration, going from a single AWS account to multiple AWS accounts, whatever you're doing, wait long enough, and inherently you're doing it wrong. And that gets into an idea of what is a best practice. A lot of times you'll do something and someone, usually a boss, shows up and says, oh, that's not a best practice. OK, great. So I did some digging and figured out what one is. And the best analog I've come up with so far is that it's a sensible default. It's in the absence of a compelling reason not to do it this way, this is how you do it. They're not ironclad rules, although that's how people tend to wind up focusing on it. Let me give you an example. Uh, one that's sort of floating around lately, pushed by a lot of enterprises and Gartner and the rest, is this idea of being multi-cloud. Uh, who here is multi-cloud today? OK. For those who haven't had the wonderful experience about this, let, let me give you an example of what this is. Let's say that you wind up writing some code, as you do. And you're probably wearing a tie when you write code, as I do. And you decide it's time to build an application. So. You want to be multi-cloud or cloud agnostic. Namely, you want to be able to run it on GCP. You'd like to be able to probably run it on AWS, because this is an AWS meetup the last time that I checked. You want to run it probably on Microsoft's Azure cloud. And due to a weird coincidence of stories here, you might want to run it on Oracle cloud as well. Now, Oracle has lawyers, and they're sensitive about their logo, so I use this clip art instead purely out of respect. So you wind up building this thing that is able to be deployed to all of these on a whim. And what happens? That's right. Everything catches fire. And most of us tend to be responsible and fix things that we break. But then the fire spreads, and you're on fire. And then you talk to me about how painful it is, and you're not very careful, and now I'm on fire. Which sort of leads to a great question, who the hell am I, and why am I speaking to you folks today? So, I do a lot of things, but it all starts from what I do for a living. I'm a cloud economist as an independent consultant. I come into companies and I fix the horrifying AWS bill, which is a problem that could be related to by pretty much everyone who's ever touched Amazon. Uh, as a part of that, I run an incredibly sarcastic newsletter called Last Week in AWS where I gather up all the news throughout the week that Amazon announces. I throw out the nonsense that absolutely no one cares about, like, ooh, a third CloudFront Edge location in Dallas. Even people in Dallas could not possibly care less about that one. And then whatever's left, I make fun of. And I send that out every Monday morning, and it sort of turned into a thing, somehow. I also have a podcast called Screaming in the Cloud, where I talk about the business of cloud computing with various people who are uh, apparently not good at vetting my background and figure it might be a good idea to talk with me. They don't usually make that mistake more than once. But effectively, I also have a small child who fundamentally is the reason I do all of these things. Feel free to shoot me an email, tweet at me if you want to ask me questions, including what the hell's your problem. I get that one a lot. It's, I have a polished answer to that. So, Fundamentally, what I'm about to talk about today are the best practices as I see them in 2018, when you're doing things with AWS, with cloud in general. These are not really backed by any official organization. These are what I see given a sort of weird perspective on the industry. At the end, during Q&A, I'd love to hear what people think I get wrong. I'd love to hear what people think I get right. And what do I put in the next version of this talk? So please, throw them my way. So once upon a time, there was something called the Toaster Project, where a guy tried to build a toaster entirely from scratch. And he came up with something that kind of works, sort of. It caught fire halfway through the first time he tried to use it, and no one wanted to eat what came out of it. This is a beautiful metaphor for building your own, for example, container orchestration systems. If it's not your business's core competency, don't build it yourself. 
we sell socks, therefore we have to run our own version of Kubernetes, usually doesn't tend to follow naturally. And companies run into this all the time. And everyone says, oh yeah, we only write things that are in our core competency that solve specific problems that we have here, like provisioning instances. Every, everyone has that problem. Another one is, for example, secrets management. If I don't understand why people have so much trouble with this. I just take the secrets and hard code them into my, into my code base, and then I'm done. I mean, I don't see the problem. There, it's a private Git repo. What's the issue here? The problem here is fundamentally that people continue trying to roll their own on this. If you're in AWS and you can get away with it, use Parameter Store, use Secrets Manager, use, a use a HashiCorp's Vault. There's a bunch of different answers here that don't involve running your own infrastructure to handle these things. And unless you've got a really compelling reason to do it, don't do it yourself. Everyone's nodding like, yeah, that's a really good point. And they're going to go back to their offices and roll their own. There's a URL that might make sense to look at. That really should have been bigger on the slide, my apologies. But it's daysuntilreinvent.com. Generally speaking, when that number is less than 90, it's a terrific time not to start a new AWS architectural project. They have this obnoxious way of releasing things at reInvent that completely blow away everything you just did and come out with a better version that's supportable. Has anyone here ever built something and then a week or two later, Amazon released it and you had to throw yours away? Yeah. Good, it's not just me. I thought it was Nostradamus for a minute there. But no, it happens to everyone. It's, oh, it's the third time this year. That's, that's impressive past a certain point. There is a better answer than just putting a, pressing pause for three months out of the year. And that is that Amazon employees take their NDAs seriously, but they also have families. And occasionally, they can, they can make a value judgment as far as which they care for more. Uh, somewhat less threateningly, if you have enterprise support, it's a tremendous waste of money unless you use it properly. And the proper way to use it is to loop your account manager in on what the hell you're doing. If it's a story of, yeah, we're thinking about building this thing that's going to solve this problem, they will, under the NDA you have signed when you joined enterprise support, tell you aspects of their roadmap that conflict with exactly what you're doing. Sometimes the response is, oh, you're building that? Well, why don't we let you onto our private beta so you can try this thing and tell us how it works? Which is a much better scenario than building it yourself, wasting six months, and then having to replace it anyway. Talk to your TAMs. People don't do that enough. Let's see. Other best practices. Yeah. So Oracle Cloud. Don't use it. <laughs> this is not just a technical assessment. Is anyone here using Oracle Cloud? Okay, no one's brave. Good, good, good. Uh, does anyone here work for Oracle? I'm sure I'll find out in the woodshed afterwards. But no, it's the problem I have with Oracle is not that it's crappy from a technical perspective, even though it is. It's that they have this history that goes back years of suing their customers. And from my perspective, that seems to be a ridiculous business risk to wind up going with something that is not orders of magnitude better than anything else out there. And in 2018, there's precious little that they are. Sometimes you wind up strong-armed into it. If you've got legacy architecture you're migrating, running Oracle on AWS can be a challenge, but there are ways around it. I'm not suggesting that you categorically refuse to do it, but as a best practice, not Oracle seems like a good plan. On the other side of the spectrum, um, Google Cloud, I would argue, has technology that is about three to five years ahead of AWS in a lot of respects. I mean that sincerely. And in fact, oh, never mind, they've already terminated this slide. Sorry. They have this habit of turning things off that people are using, running businesses on, etc. And they don't seem to understand that this makes people very gun-shy about using them. It's terrific technology, I mean that sincerely, but they think like a group of engineers. They don't think in terms of who their customers are, what the business looks like, and they claim that they're absolutely going to stop doing that, and then they do it again. They just raised prices in the Google Maps API. They're turning off inbox. Oh, but that's a consumer product. It's not a corporate product, so you should know the difference. Really? Because they both say Google on the top of them. I shouldn't need to memorize your org chart in order to figure out, is this something that's going to be around in three years? Counterpoint, Amazon's on the opposite end of that spectrum, because everything that they build, they're going to support forever, even though we wish they'd kill it. You can still get simple DB even though you really shouldn't in almost every case, for example. And I don't have a whole lot to say about Azure, except for the fact that they, as a company, 
have 40 years of experience apologizing for software failures, and this serves them really well in the cloud. I mean that not entirely sarcastically. When there's an outage, and spoiler, everyone's going to take an outage, they're very good at explaining what happened, why they did it, and calming executives, which is handy. There's some interesting things about them from a technical point of view. Uh, they're the only cloud provider that will offer you an SLA around individual instances, which is simultaneously really cool and really scary about what it says about how they think about workloads. So it's one of those sort of mixed bags type of things. But this is an AWS meetup, and I want to spend most of my time talking about Amazon. And we're going to start here with a tip. If Amazon pisses you off, as they do to all of us from time to time, you can wind up slowing down one of their product development teams to a crawl for about six months by giving them a puppy, and then force them to name it. You ever notice that Amazon is complete crap at naming things in a way that makes sense to anyone? Sometimes services start with AWS, sometimes they start with Amazon, and there's really no way of determining what it is. They just throw a bunch of words on a slide. I mean, the, no joke for EKS is the Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes on EC2. How straightforward. Other best practices. That's what I look like every month when I, my bill comes in, because no one understands it. I do this for a living, and it still takes deep dives to, to figure that out. If you're sitting there and thinking that you're the only person who doesn't get why the bill just did what it did, Relax, you're not. It's confusing, it's annoying, and there seems to be no remedy in sight these days. Here's a question for you. Who here spins up resources in the console? I know, it's sort of a guilty secret from time to time. You're not going to convince me everyone in this room is using CloudFormation, Terraform, or Ansible. My because how I learn is I spin things up in the console. They launch something, it's like, I'm surprised this is a brand new service, and I had no idea it was coming. And, which is funny, because that's what the person who runs CloudFormation says. Wow, this is brand new, and I had no idea it was coming. And there's no way to do it programmatically when they first come out. Once you're done with that, throw away what you've built and rebuild it programmatically, because it gets more and more painful the more you come to rely on that thing. A pattern that I tend to like that some companies have gone into is they disallow access into the production account for the console. Everything that goes through there has to be done programmatically. So yeah, in a dev account, you can play around with pets a fair bit, but go ahead and get over to a point where you can do that somewhat intelligently and have it gated for safety. You will thank me later on that one. So this one is one of those obvious in hindsight type of things, where no one knows what size they're going to need an instance to be, so they pick one of the big ones that burns money, like a diesel truck burns fuel. And that might not be a great example. I'm not really a car guy. But it winds up turning into this story where you have these enormous instances that are sitting there idle, and no one remembers to go back and turn those down. If you start with the smallest instance and then you smack into a wall or resource limit, then you go ahead and make it bigger iteratively, you figure out what it takes, and then you're not overwhelmingly building these things out. The second order effect of this is it teaches development teams to think in terms of resource-constrained environments. Because, oh, it's the cloud. It scales infinitely. No, it doesn't. I've tried it. You run out of resources real quick on a per-account basis, on a, oh, we don't have enough of those in that particular availability zone. That tends to be a challenge. Uh, oh, one other thing to be aware of, that it's one of those things that everyone knows until you realize someone didn't. Uh, availability zones, let's say US East 1, you have A, B, C, D, E, and F. Those aren't consistent between accounts. My A could be your C. And it's not at all clear what those look like. You can sort of unpack that by looking at things that are unique, like the Spot History API. But the reason they did that originally was to avoid narratives like, oh, C is the crappy one, so never use it. Because yes, there was a crappy one for a long time. There still are two that aren't terrific, but that's neither here nor there. So there's one thing people love. It's telling you you're using the wrong database. And I've wound up going around the rabbit hole for 18 months on this and never came out with a consensus. So accept you're going to get it wrong and pick one. For example, I don't, for my key value store, I don't like using DynamoDB. I use AWS Secrets Manager. It in no way was designed to be a database, and that's what I love about it. You tell people in Amazon about this, and the blood drains from their face as they realize, yes, people really are that dumb. 
I, I tend to wield my ignorance as a club sometimes. Uh, quick poll for the room. Who here has just one AWS account? OK. Two? Three. OK. Let's see if we can start. OK. Four to 10? OK. More than 10? More than 20? More than 50? OK. I'm not going to keep picking numbers. How many, can you mention a ballpark figure? OK. Reasonable. I've been on engagements that have 3,000. That's one of those not going anywhere for a while, grab a Snickers moments. But yeah, it's generally speaking, a best practice is to split your Amazon account into multiple accounts. This one's controversial, but usually the number that you'll need will not come from engineering. It's going to come from finance. Generally, you're going to want them tied to individual items on the P&L. You're going to want them to wind up being things that make sense to how your business sees these things. Yes, that means reorgs are going to be a bloody nightmare, but that's future problems. The but if nothing else, having separate development and production accounts does a few handy things. It limits the blast radius. It means that when you accidentally exhaust a resource limit on a single account, it's not going to bleed over into other accounts. There are hard-coded rate limits around things on a per-account basis that Amazon will only raise so high. They used to say, oh, just use one account. Now they're screaming, oh, yes, use plenty of accounts. It's a pain to migrate them. It is more painful tomorrow. So start now. Related to my last point, go ahead and make friends in finance. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of them to begin with, and they'll appreciate the human interaction. That joke did not work when I gave it to a bunch of accountants, pro tip. Uh, but, they run in, but they run into this problem where they think they're dealing with a lot of cloud spend issues, and they don't think about it in the same way that you folks do. They tend to view it from a very different lens. It's not production versus pre-production. It's COGS versus R&D. You're talking about the same types of things, but you're speaking in different languages. Half of my job, it seems, is introducing people who've never met before. Oh, you're in finance. You're in engineering. You've been coworkers in the same building for five years. You two should talk. And it, it's one of those communication things that as soon as you start breaking down those walls, you start learning a lot more, not just about the business that you work in, but also how your company views moving to the cloud. This is not a cost talk, but that's one of the things I found. Vacations are important. This one is less about uh, cloud advice and more life advice, but there is a burnout component here. Um, it's helpful to remember that when you, ask, when you ask your boss if you can take time off, you're not asking permission to go on vacation. You're asking whether you're still going to have a job when you come back. And it's handy at times to think about it that way. If it's, oh, we just can't spare you taking the time off, keep working, eventually you'll grow to hate this stuff and want to do something else. That's why I started consulting rather than writing code at 3 AM. You have to take me time. Self-care is important in this stuff. Somewhat relatedly, I hate the term soft skills, or as we like to call it in other circles, talking to human beings. They're hard as hell. And it's like anything else. It's a skill that can be mastered. You can have the best engineering idea in the world. If you don't know how to articulate the value to the business, it doesn't matter. Everyone's selling something. It's just a question of whether they know it or not. Learn to tell a story. Speaking of telling stories, again, this is more life advice, but still handy and extremely relevant to almost everyone. If you're talking to your company and you're looking, or you're looking to a new company, the companies already know how much everyone makes. They talk to a bunch of candidates. They know what their pay scales are. They talk to their friends at other companies. But somehow, we still have this attitude in America, at least, where it's rude or extremely unsightly or whatever it is. You never talk about your salary with your coworkers. You're the only people who don't know in that entire value chain. And it's one of those things where if you don't understand what your market rate is, find out. Start talking to people about this. Employees are never well served by not discussing these things. Management has a whole separate problem tied to it, but, that, but that's not here for there. Let's talk tech again. You should absolutely be doing SRE. You should absolutely be doing the DevOps. You should absolutely be doing serverless. You should absolutely be doing cloud. You should absolutely be doing functional programming. You should be doing you, what makes sense for your organization. You can find angry children on the internet telling you that you're using the wrong language, the wrong approach to things. Your architecture is bad, and you should feel bad about it. And it is a complete waste of time. It's demoralizing. 
Find a thing that works for you. If you're embarrassed by your architecture because you see someone from a big name tech company get up on a stage, yeah, don't be. Your problems aren't their problems. Netflix was famous for this. They get up and talk about how they build this thing to solve their problems. First, they have more money than they know what to do with to spend on these problems. Most of us don't have that concern. And their failure mode is someone's stream stops working and they have to restart it. A really bad failure mode, mode is someone has to go outside today. And, but that's not the end of the world. If you work for a bank, you have different priorities and that's okay. Finding someone to tell you that this is how we do it here at any large company, they're also not being completely honest possibly with themselves. Different large companies have different divisions that do everything differently. There's no unifying way that any one organization past about 50 people winds up doing things across the board. Take everything with a grain of salt. My solutions won't work for you because I don't know what your constraints are. Anyone know what that is? That's right, that's the AWS status page. <laughs> it is a sea of green and it lies to you. I uh, built a domain, stop.lying.cloud, that cuts down on some of the sea of green. But honestly, if you wind up seeing an issue in the middle of the night, one of the first things I like to do is check DevOps Twitter. If suddenly everyone you know is awake and talking about something, it's probably not your code. This is the single biggest thing I wish monitoring companies would address because they have this global observer perspective where they wind up, like PagerDuty, for example, sends out all the alerts. They know when something in US East 1, one of their availability zones explodes because they're paging everyone. And no one else is really able to do that. It's, well, was it our code? Or is there something underlying in the infrastructure that does this? I would love a global traffic report for something like this. If anyone knows of anything, please send it to me. I've been asking and not getting an answer on that one for years. Life lesson I learned the fun way is you can unload on your boss or on a client once because you won't be around for the second one. The lesson here, make it count. You want it to be over on a hill worth dying on and ultimately they didn't get you the keyboard you wanted is not that hill for most of us. It's extremely unhelpful when talking to people to act like you're the smartest person in the room. If you are the smartest person in the room, you'll find that it is still surprisingly unhelpful because people are humans. They don't necessarily want to fall into the, oh, well, he's a complete jerk, but he's right. Or, wow, she's incredibly offensive, but her code's solid. No, people don't want to do business or work with people that, are, that make them feel bad be able to articulate things in a way that gets people on board. There are now over 120 Amazon services out there. Can anyone name them all? Yeah. Now, we're at a point now where I can talk incredibly convincingly about Amazon services that don't exist and not get called out on it by Amazon employees. You really need to know only a handful of services as you look at that entire chart. And I built one for you. There are really six that matter because every other advanced level service generally ties back to one of these. EC2, it's your VM as a service thing. That, uh, that ties into how disks work, it ties into how the networking works, and that informs almost everything else you do. S3 is an object store. It's not that hard to learn, but it is a different concept than storing files or storing blocks. Spend half a day doing a deep dive and you'll be much better for it. IAM policies, which is just a terrible pile of crap, unfortunately. But it's incredibly confusing, it's wordy, and if I weren't doing billing consulting, that's the problem I would fix. Hi, I'm here to take a look and do an audit of your security policies to keep you out of the headlines. It seems like it would be a somewhat compelling sales pitch. Load balancers have a lot of interesting ways of being implemented, especially now that instead of one, the ELB, they now have three. The ELB classic, classic by the way, is an Amazon word that means we're deprecating it, but it'll still be around forever. Like you wind up with the, uh, like, uh, what is it? What's that old poem? A uh, traveler in a, uh, for, in a foreign, in an ancient land, uh, saw a trunkless, two legs of stone, nothing else remained. Yeah, and those two, lo two legs were balanced by the ELB classic because they're never turning that thing off. You have the application load balancer and the network load balancer. They're both kind of weird, but everyone's using them for something. That's a service that's worth spending some time going on a dive in. The console. 
you need to know how to click around in the console. It's one of those things where sometimes it's the only way to get a good visual on a lot of these things, because the APIs are, let's call it maddeningly inconsistent. And of course, Lambda, their new serverless thing, that is ushering in a new way of thinking about things, and regardless of what else you do, people are gluing them together with Lambda functions. It's for those of you who are like me, who came up from the ops side of the world and only learned to code delicately and begrudgingly, that'll mostly get you by. You can sort of brute force your way through it for a while, but it's not going to go away and it's not going to get easier. If you're spinning and trying to figure out what language to use, I default to Python. Some people prefer Node. There's no wrong answer here, but pick something and go for it. Now. Aside from those, those are the important ones. An awful lot of Amazon services are terrible disappointments because they're garbage. But out of respect for the product teams, I'm not going to name the terrible services that are out there. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. I'm totally going to name them. So. <laughs> SES is their email as a platform service. It's great until you want to actually you know, send email and make sure it got there. You get to build everything out of that out from scratch, and it gets you nowhere. CloudWatch is their monitoring thing, which is supposed to tell you everything about your environment, but it won't tell you how much they're going to charge you for using their monitoring service. It's confusing and likes to have graphs that drop off to zero at the end of the most recent, uh, at the most recent data point. On any normal system, that means your site just crapped itself to death, but that's just normal within CloudWatch. API Gateway, it's expensive, it's confusing. Think of it as a networking Swiss army knife, by which I mean the instructions are written in Swiss German. No one can make heads or tails out of the documentation. It does a lot, but you're going to spend three days figuring out how and what. Amazon Chime is their Slack equivalent. Picture Slack, only somehow even worse. Uh, Cost Explorer lets you, explains your bill to you. And it doesn't do it very well. So people pay things like Cloud Health instead to wind up solving that problem for them. And it just, it, it's miserable. It's, it's like charging someone to explain the bill to them at a restaurant. I, I can't picture a waitstaff person doing that and not getting punched in the face. And Glacier, which is sort of a weird one. It's the long-term archival storage version of S3. It's cheap, restores take a while. Does anyone here store anything in Glacier? Right. Has anyone here ever retrieved anything from Glacier? Yeah, most hands go down on that one. Yeah, a few people have. On purpose or? OK. Good, good, good. They, they do. Yeah. Oh, I'm not done. Here's slide two. So Pinpoint <laughs> combines SES and Cognito, which is below it, to wind up doing this. Oh, we'll use it to send out newsletters or alerts to various mobile devices. And no one can make heads or tails out of it. I spent three weeks trying, and then I gave up, and I used SendGrid like a normal person. Uh, trusted advisor, uh, it does neither of those things. Uh, plausible suggestion would probably be a better answer for it. It tells you how to optimize things for security, cost, etc. in your account, but you have to pay for at least business support to get most of the checks. Awesome. CloudFormation is wordy and annoying. Terraform is broken in different ways, but right now neither one of them is terrific. They're releasing something called the CDK, the Cloud Developer Kit that winds up basically getting all the wordy boilerplate played onto something condensed, it's still crappy. Uh, the console, have you ever tried to use it in large accounts or find anything in it or see consistency between product to product? Of course you have. That's why you're laughing. And of course, reInvent, the big conference, which is also known as Amazon's complex queuing service, where we all stand in line and spend way too much money and spend time walking and don't get into sessions we wanted to see and wonder why the hell we're here and yet we somehow go back next year because we have mental problems. And yeah, has anyone here been to reInvent before or am I just ranting into the void? Is anyone going this year? Yeah, there's going to be a support group. We meet at the bar every night. Oh, I'm still not done, by the way. So Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. It's a piece of crap. It's not there yet. They had to get something out the door that said Kubernetes on it. It wasn't first to market. It wasn't best of breed. And today, I view it as something of a failed product. If you're running Kubernetes in production, don't use it. ECS, slightly better, but it winds up being this weird halfway point where you still have to care about instances and all the rest and handle the orchestration components. It's not there. There's no great answer there. 
Config looks at your account and tells you you're doing it wrong, along with inspector. Where does one stop and the other begin? We're not sure. They wound up putting both of those things out independently, despite the fact that they largely try to do the exact same thing. It's kind of like managing things with Chef or Puppet, like OpsWorks would do, but that's not either of these services either. Welcome to hell. IAM, no one understands it. You look at, is this permission scope too broadly or not? No one knows, and it scares the crap out of all of us. And of course, the damn bill. Okay, that is, I actually am stopping now at this point for crapping on services. Otherwise, this becomes a three hour talk. But I do want to talk about six services I admire that I think are doing a lot of things that are right. These are the hidden gems. Workspaces took me a depressingly long time to figure out. It's a client that, they have a client that runs on anything at this point, tablets, some very large phones if you're masochistic, Macs, PCs, etc. And you can remote into a virtual desktop running in an AWS region. They have Windows support, they have Linux support, they let you install all kinds of things. It's handy for large scale stuff because all the data still lives in AWS. It's extremely snappy as far as responsiveness goes. And it basically lets you migrate around, move around on a thin client here in the real world. It's something I think more companies should look into. I would pay an embarrassing amount of money for one on Mac OS, but they don't have that yet. The database migration service uh, started off as super crappy, where it would do things like not validate the data it was migrating. That's the sort of thing where if you give that project to an intern and they come back with it, you're like, wow, this is what we call a learning experience. It's a teachable moment of why you always validate what you did. But no, they took it to production, and it's awesome. Uh, they mention on slides that there have been 40,000 database migrations that came out of it. And it's like, cool, how many of that was the same database people kept retrying because of errors? It, it went from a rocky start to something that's really kind of nice, and it's sort of misnamed. You can use it as real-time replication between different databases, uh, between Oracle to Postgres or Postgres to MySQL. Apparently, you can also target things like MongoDB, DynamoDB, S3 somehow. It, it effectively is glue that speaks between all these different database systems out there. And if you have a problem that looks like that, it's worth a look. Uh, the EC2 network, despite the fact that it's complex and confusing, is a thing of beauty. The sheer scale of it is mind-boggling to me. I have a history as a network engineer, and being able to look at how they're doing these things in a reasonably performant way is its just something that's impressive. Route 53 is one of only two AWS services that has 100% SLA. They guarantee that their DNS service will not go down. It mostly doesn't. Again, I, I would never put 100% availability on anything because I know how the world works and I've used a computer before. But it's incredibly deep, it's complex. There's a lot of evolving work going on there. And that's one of the services that you'll probably pick up along the way. But if you have a fundamental grasp of how DNS works, this is an hour to pick up at most. It's not one of those things like EC2 where go spend six months on top of the mountain and then come down and then you're ready to begin learning. This tends to work out reasonably well. And Lambda is sort of changing the game for a lot of this. It's a ridiculous, limited, constrained toy today. In 18 months, it won't be. So this is something to keep an eye on, and the time to get on board that train is probably now. The point I'm trying to make here is that this stuff is complex. No one knows all of it. I still wind up learning about services I hadn't heard of before or I'd forgotten existed. And again, I spend a non-trivial amount of time keeping up with Amazon news on a constant basis. No one else really has that in their job description. So it, it's natural to look at the stuff you know and minimize it because there's all these other things that, that they're releasing. Don't feel bad. No one has it all in their head. In fact, you take five services and that is 85% of the world's spend on Amazon. Then there's a AWS. Then there's a long tail of the rest of them that solve very specific problems for very specific clients. I mean, they have a service that's a, a tire tractor trailer full of drives that you, can throw, that you can throw 100 petabytes on and ship it in. Most of us don't have that problem. Has anyone used one of those before? The big truck things? Sorry, lifelong goal here is to beep the horn, but I have to find one first and then break into a data center. No, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there. They do a lot of neat stuff, and a lot of them are targeted very specific niches. So certifications are worthless. Certifications are incredibly valuable. Two statements that are complete opposites. Which one applies to you depends on you, not the certification. What do you want to get out of it? 
Some people find the process of learning what you need to get the certification is a great way to learn. Some people, if they're starting out their careers and they don't have anything that demonstrates knowledge in the cloud space, it's a great way to get exposure to it. If you're thinking that I'm going to get all the certifications and put them on the resume and then it'll be an instant snap my fingers, land a job, sorry, those days are gone. It's not, it's indica it can replace experience to a point. It's not going to be one of those things that completely catapults you into the stratosphere. But it might give you a leg up. Whether it makes sense for you depends on you, depends on what you're hoping to get out of it. There's no single right answer. The managers in the room always hate this one. Go ahead and interview at other companies every three to six months if you can find a time to do it. It opens your eyes to a few different things. First, it lets you know what the rest of the world is doing. You're not just stuck seeing your own company's infrastructure. Find the problems others are having. The first time I heard about Docker when I was going on job interviews, I laughed. That sounds like a ridiculous toy slash re-implementation of a concept that's 40 years old. I still argue I was mostly right, but by the third interviewer went on, and I went on and they talked about this, okay, there's something here. I need to learn more about it so I can make fun of it more accurately. And that's handy. You also, interviewing is a skill like anything else. If you don't practice it, you lose it. And unfortunately, the way that interviews work in today's world, we're going to decide to hire you or not hire you based entirely upon a set of skills you only use when you're looking for a job. So if you take a job for five years and lose all of it, oh, you seem like a crappy employee. Keeping the saw sharp in this sense means that when you look for the interesting opportunities, you'll, have, you'll be more practiced and able to tell your story. If you get an offer, it also gives you a rough idea of what market rate for your salary is. And yes, there are easier ways to find that, but it's pretty convincing proof when someone says, we'll pay you this to come here. It, it's hard to argue the survey was slanted on that data point. It also helps you meet people. At least once in my career, I have hired my interviewer. It never hurts to go out there and, and you talk about what you're doing. Oh, that sounds terrible. We're not doing anything like that. And they get a hunted look in their face. Are, are you hiring? It never hurts. It's a great way to meet people. And one of my tricks as well when I'm looking at, a, at my next job is I sort of ignore the next job and I think about the job I want after it. So what is the next job that's going to get me there? Like if I want to go and spend time doing cloud architecture, great. Today if I work in an on-premise environment, I should probably go spend some time as an engineer in a cloud-centric environment. So it helps inform what I do and it's not just random. So why do you go work there? They made me a job offer. Okay, great. Be more intentional with what you do. Again, I keep coming back to this point. Don't trust anything someone on stage says to you, except me, because no one gets up here and talks about their failures. And even in the rare talks where they do of, yeah, we wound up making a decision to roll out a terrible piece of software. Okay, enough about OpenStack. And, we just, and it turned out that this was a mistake. Great. People, people mention that rarely they never mention how the decision was made. Well, this is great, I'm not trying to blame anyone, but why did you pick OpenStack? No one talks about the decision-making process, which means we don't get to learn from the process of how we went through it. It's important to make sure that you understand as well that people tell lofty stories about how they wound up building something. The beautiful slides that you see, the architecture diagrams that look like they came directly out of a white paper somewhere. Yeah, it's polite fiction. There are people who are in the project watching the talk about it. At the end, it's like, I don't remember that project you talked about. I would have liked to have been on that project rather than the one where I didn't see my wife and kids for six months. We all tell polite fictions, and sometimes we lie to ourselves to hide the trauma. Another best practice for you. Subscribe to Last Week in AWS.com, yes, where you can find all of these interesting things going on in the world and my ridiculous newsletter that makes fun of it. Another best practice in the industry is, of course, to follow me on Twitter. I make fun of things because I imagine I'm funny. My Twitter handle's on the bottom of most of my slides. Lastly, I want to thank you all for tolerating this very rough draft of a talk that might eventually turn into something that's worth listening to. At this point, I do want to hear from the rest of you as far as what you thought about it. Let's talk. What problems are you seeing? What architectural challenges are you faced with that it seems like there's no good answer to? Give feedback on the talk. Tell me what my problem is. Please, by all means, this is an open forum. It's a conversation.
I promise not to make fun of anyone. Yes? The biggest problem I see is deciding which, what to use. Yep. Because, you know, you mentioned, you touched on Osworth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And for two weeks, I couldn't figure out the difference between them. So that, you know, picking yeah. which product to use mm -hmm. is, to me, one of the biggest struggles. That's a great point, and a lot of people have it. It's called analysis paralysis in a lot of places, where it's this idea of you want to make sure you make the right decision, and you wind up burning so much time trying to make the right one. I look back at the technical decisions I've made, and frankly, a lot of them are kind of embarrassing. But by making them, I, I can now talk authoritatively about why it was the wrong decision. And even a bad decision, can be you can back out of it once you find out it won't work, or you can maneuver it in such a way that it starts to. And being able to just continue moving forward rather than descending into research often becomes valuable. One of my approaches is there's a link on here that goes to the open guide to AWS's Slack team. The entire guide is an open source project on GitHub. You search for open guide AWS. Uh, it's many. Uh, it's a giant mark markdown document that gives all of the tips and tricks that you would give a buddy who's starting out in AWS over a drink. Uh, oh, you're launching an AWS environment, or you're trying to pick between OpsWorks and all, all the other things you can do for your use case. Well, here's what I would do in your shoes. Because, oh, that thing you're trying, yeah, I wasted four months on that. Here's why it's terrible. Do this instead. Learning from the mistakes of others. There's a strong community growing around this. And you know you have a great platform for the cloud when there's an entire community that's dedicated to explaining it to each other because you can't do it yourself. Great plan, Amazon. But I guess learning from other people, talking about it with them, and if everyone is still on the fence, pick something and take your best shot. Great question, though. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. What's the what's it going to cost me next month? The answer is nobody knows. I must consult the bones. Yeah. Oh yeah. In fact, a lot of the community talk revolves specifically around that. Um, for example, DynamoDB. You can now encrypt things at rest, and you can use a KMS key. So that it winds up, uh, so now, great, it's encrypted. Everything winds up working out really well. But every request to KMS, I think it costs something like, I think, three pennies for every 1,000 requests or something like that. And that was horrifying until I read the fine print. Every time it does that, it caches the key for five minutes. So it's only one request. OK, still not going to be the cheapest thing in the world, but it's also not going to wind up being a phone number on your bill. Yeah, the economics of it are inscrutable. This is also why test environments are awesome, and at least glance over the pricing page. I, would, I still maintain that engineers should generally not spend too much time worrying about what the cost of a thing is going to be. I mean, I, I see this a lot with my work, where it seems like people go through the bill alphabetically rather than starting with the big numbers. Like, ah, you didn't find $80 a month in unassociated elastic IPs. Right. I'm giving you a short list of low effort things that saves $800,000. Then we'll go and worry about the pocket change. Because right now, you're embezzling more than that in office supplies every month. So don't really sweat the small stuff. I mean, I'm, this is the problem I run into is because this is what I do. I sit there trying to optimize my stupid $11 bill. And it's one of those, ooh, I bet I could knock 20 cents off of that. It, stop, stop. I have, I have a thing to do that makes money rather than focusing on the rat hole. That's the engineer in me I keep trying to escape from. I get it. But there's often a bigger strategic picture. Believe me, when the bill gets too high, accounting will let you know. Something that surprised me in that sense is last month's bill is $3 million. This month's bill is $4 million. And the CFO suddenly crops an abacus and kicks your door off the hinges wanting to know what happened. It's not the million dollars. It's the fact that it was a sudden spike. Is this the new normal? What caused, it? What caused that? We didn't predict it. Do we have to issue guidance, adjust our marginal unit, our unit of uh, model, our model for unit economics? Is our marginal cost providing goods change? Is it development? Is it production? What is it? It's the lack of observability, not the actual dollars and cents. It took me an embarrassingly long time to learn that one. Yeah. Is that entire $11 bill using secret manager the key value? Surprisingly, no. Uh, and it also doesn't include my obnoxious domain habit. But yeah. Uh, Secrets Managers gets expensive. It's $40 per item you store in it with a 4K limit. Yeah, It's 40 cents? Yeah, what did I say? Four? You said 
oh yeah, sorry, 40 cents. Yes, you're right, wow. Yeah, I would have noticed that. Not yet, but I'm about to scale that puppy up and we're gonna see what happens. There's a thing called reInvent credits for taking surveys and I use them to do terrible things. Yes? What's your beef with Blazor? Specifically the fact that it's one of those things that's not very well understood and no one ever retrieves from it. It's, one of, it's effectively, you may as well, for the vast majority of data that lives in it, just delete it because no one ever does a retrieval in most environments. I took a survey, Who, uh, this, this room's a little on the surprising side, maybe it's a San Francisco thing, but we have this cult of big data. The cult of big data, we wanna store all of our data to mine it for something. Cool, that's 80 petabytes and growing, that's costing an enormous pile of money. Well, there might be value hidden in that data. Yeah, okay. That's the trick, yes, absolutely. But generally audit logs do not, in most regimes extend to every piece of data you've thrown off. There's a finite site, for example, it's not everything CloudWatch log spits out, it might just be CloudTrail, for example, and which is a much smaller data set. But you're right, again, this, these are generalities and frankly, easy laughs in some ways. Everyone, every service out there has its defenders. What, you don't like IAM and think it's beautifully constructed, says the guy who thinks only in numbers. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that winds up, everyone, every service has its fans, and I don't understand some of those people. Other questions, comments, criticisms, things I should include for next time, things I shouldn't include for next time. Okay. We can put it on speaker, it's fine. <laughs> what else are people working on? What's difficult? What's obnoxious? What do you not understand about AWS and wish you did? Yes. Yes. It absolutely is. Um, the serverless framework is getting a little bit better at managing that. That's my weapon of choice when it comes time for building these things out. They, Amazon themselves is advocating for the serverless application model, and their big selling point on that is that it has a cute mascot in the form of a squirrel, which, as it turns out, is not how I make technical decisions anymore. So, <laughs> thanks, boss. Yeah, and it... I think it's too wordy, it's difficult to wrap your head around, and what I love about the serverless framework is you define everything as a YAML file. Yeah, I know, some people like JSON, don't yell at me. And they wound up, and they've built this thing that's very simple to build this thing out that just works. The way that they structure IAM principles for least privilege are if you don't have the role already defined, you now have to drop a bunch of CloudFormation boilerplate in. I think that there's either something coming out soon to fix that, or there's a plugin that already does. I haven't gone into it lately because right now I think my most convoluted uh, serverless environment has three Lambda functions, and okay, I'll just let all of them write to that one particular DynamoDB table. It's my list of links for next week. It's, okay, if someone breaches that, they're gonna get the funny jokes a little bit early and see how the sausage is made. It, my risk profile is minimal. If it were the thing that lets you subscribe email uh, addresses to my newsletter and then send email to them, yeah, I'm a lot more restrictive about that. But it is a serious problem that I think that a lot of people are articulating. It's a colossal pain in the neck, and you're not alone. Don't think that, oh, it's just because you don't get something. Nope, we're all in that ridiculous boat. Yeah. Do you think Amazon will be not multi-master Postgre via Aurora or some other way in the future? Uh, multi-master Aurora? Um, they've pre-announced multi-master for MySQL, and generally Postgres tends to draft right along behind it. Yeah, there's a developer preview of it that they announced, and then they aren't, uh, they haven't said anything since then. It's one of those weird areas where we're still seeing what's, Amazon has this habit of pre-announcing things, and sometimes it comes out a week later, and other times it's a year goes past. Remember the wait for C5 instances? We're like, yeah, this will be coming out soon, and nine months go by, which was great, because it gave me something to yell at the Tams about whenever we had meetings. Because, you know, it's always their personal fault. Like, I, I work for an enormous organization. Yeah, it's my personal fault that this thing isn't out. I'm like, good, glad we understand each other. And then I keep berating them because I'm a jerk. But do it constructively. It's punch up, not down. Yeah, I don't know is the, right, the short answer on that. I'd love to. If that's something you're looking at seriously and you have enterprise support, reach out to your TAM. They will give you a more accurate roadmap around that stuff. If there is a developer preview, which there probably is, but I haven't seen, 
they'll probably, they, they, they generally consider companies asking for this stuff for inclusion. And it also helps raise the priority of it when they start hearing customer feedback requesting these things. Yeah, I'd love to get multi-master going, especially cross-region, for a few different things. I mean, you have DynamoDB global tables, but that doesn't really do it the same way. Well, global tables, only available in some regions. It's like, well, I'm going to define some words for you now and see what falls out of it. Other questions, comments, concerns? While you're thinking of questions to ask me, I'm going to look up very quickly whether something that's supposed to be coming out later today came out so I can talk about it. Crap, not yet. Okay, there's going to be a whole other whole spiel on this, but it comes out supposedly this afternoon, but time zones are screwing with me. Yes? Uh, the biggest billing what? Oh, sure. Oh, great question. Billing faux pas. Um, the first is that companies decide they're going to do, they're going to buy some reserved instances. And they decide to do a whole bunch, of, they do a prepaid, and okay, and holy crap, that's a lot of money. What if we get it wrong? In US East 1, there are 140 different instance types between family and size that you can buy, although size is now flexible. And that doesn't include things like tenancy, duration, how whether they're convertible or not. So people freeze. Analysis paralysis hits again. And they spend six months debating it. On a one-year RI, break-evens in seven months. Unless you turn everything off, you're going to spend that money anyway. May as well get a discount. If you're on the fence about it, drop the buy by 10% and then buy it. It's, it's hesitation is the big one. There's a whole bunch of low-hanging fruit that varies from bill to bill. Um, not doing anything with lifecycle policies in S3. Uh, failed multi-part uploads. You get charged for them, but they don't show up in any client. If you try to upload a 10 gigabyte file and you do one gigabyte chunks, nine of them show up, 10th one dies, all nine are still sitting there waiting for the 10th permanently unless there's a lifecycle policy. Set one for seven days and go for it. Um, Manage NAT gateway data processing. If you have a private subnet that wants to speak to the internet, you have two choices. You can build a, you run your own NAT instances, or you can use their managed NAT gateway service, which is awesome. But it charges half a penny per gigabyte outbound. I had a customer who was, spend, their bill was about 5 million bucks a year. 1.4 of it was managed NAT gateway data processing. So they had two options. You could either move that thing into a public subnet, which is what they did, and that drops to zero, because you still pay for the data transfer regardless. This was the processing on top of that. I may be up at order of magnitude, maybe five cents a gigabyte, regardless. It, it wound up at their scale being enormous. Or you run your own NAT instances. Yes, it's a little bit more management overhead, but for 30% of your bill, you can have someone spend two days setting up some NAT instances as a general rule. That one's common. Um, People spin, there's no uh, lack of, there's no governance or control, and people are scared to delete things. Um, you wind up spinning up an instance, and then you retire. Your instance never does. You wind up now with these things running in your account. No one knows what they do. Scared to turn it off because we've all turned off the wrong server before, and we know what fell out of that, so it's safer to leave it running. There's no, a lack of tagging, a lack of insight, a lack of visibility. There's also the somewhat misguided belief that you can cost optimize your way to your next milestone. People get so focused on the bill. Uh, I had a client who I wound up knocking about 30% off of their bill when all was said and done in the first pass. And then they kept going and optimizing and they came back like, yeah, after six months of work, we, they, we nailed another 5% off the bill, which great, awesome, terrific. I don't give you an exhaustive list. I give you where to start. And yeah, how many, so how long did it take you? Six months. For how many people? Oh, six engineers. I did the math out. It's, yeah, unless you're drastically underpaying people, you lost money on that deal. And during that time, they're spending optimizing the spend. It was generating no value for the business. You were not moving forward to, d to deliver these things. With maybe three exceptions, I don't know too many companies that spend more on Amazon than they do on payroll. People are more expensive than infrastructure in almost every case. The exceptions are effectively companies that are either not, or the, it's a single person who's not taking money out of it, or giant AI machine learning things where you need to start with 50 petabytes of data and go from there. That gets expensive quickly. Those are the big ones. I mean, there's a whole bunch of little stuff that varies on a case-by-case -case basis. It, but look at the big numbers on your bill and start there. Other questions, comments, criticisms? Yes? You talked about multiple cloud. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. It depends. Um, it, multi region is interesting and it varies based upon cloud provider. Google and Azure historically have had something of a global control plane where Amazon has religiously stayed away from it. There are a few services in AWS that, ha that still have dependencies based in US East One. But an example of this would be the big S3 apocalypse that happened a year or two ago where they wound up dropping S3 for four hours in US East. You could still use S3 in US West and everywhere else on the planet. But until it came back, you could not provision new buckets. So little weird edge cases like that. Um, the idea of going multi-region is handy for some workloads. It increases your cost. It increases your complexity. You have to deal with split brain issues. And I mean, we saw this back in data centers, where if you have like, the, like a phantom router and you wind up with a heartbeat thing so that there, you have two routers that are there, that to make sure that things wind up not going down. Most outages we saw in those scenarios were caused by heartbeat failures. The complexity of keeping the thing up on both legs took the whole thing down. Whereas if you can get away from that model and just drop a data center and uh, you still have three more to go, that winds up sometimes working better. It's also going to come down to what your application is. I mean, if you're running for some for godforsaken reason, your company does life support equipment that needs the cloud to work, yeah, you're going to want to have that in every provider in every region on the planet because as soon as you don't, you look terrible. If you're Twitter for pets, for example, maybe it's okay if you're down for a few hours. Maybe the internet's better if you're down for a few hours. Great question. It's going to come down to workload specific stuff. I mean, the classic example of going multi provider is pager duty. The thing that wakes you up in the middle of the night works in multiple providers. They're open about this um, Azure and AWS. Their marketing site, their employee sign up, all the rest does not live in multiple regions. Just the thing that absolutely has to work when one of those major providers collapses. So, for that use case, it makes an awful lot of sense. And the rest of it just becomes a cost calculation. If you're showing ads to people, for example, you can very easily calculate out the cost of downtime versus the cost of surviving that downtime by spreading it across multiple regions, providers, et cetera. And then it's just a math question. Although when you're doing these cost of ownership calculations, everyone forgets that engineers are incredibly expensive. This is not what we did when we were in school or whatnot and playing around in our evenings and weekends as a hobby. Most of us don't volunteer for our employers. If you do, stop it. But we wind up forgetting that, oh, yeah, I'm incredibly expensive. So you're sitting there telling, eh, should I spend the thing that get it for 40 bucks that makes my job easier or not? Given what it costs to employ people, keep the lights on, keep an office, your equipment, all the rest, plus your benefits, you're going to spend a lot more than that. Um, if you really want to piss people off, <laughs> I say this from personal experience, start calculating out rough numbers for how much each hour of a meeting costs. They love that. Suddenly, you go to a lot fewer meetings. It's like, cool. So we sat here, decided to buy a $500 license, and based upon the 18 people in the room, OK, this, this wound up costing us about $10,000. And we decided that we're going to punt and then make a decision in two weeks. Can you take a check? Can we just get this out of the way and move past it? It's, companies get stuck in weird processes because it's someone else's budget. I've never liked that type of thinking. This is probably why I don't fit in in enterprise life. Other questions, criticisms, concerns? Yeah. It seems like you didn't mention RDS. Mm -hmm. I didn't. You just said something about like multiple monitors. Yes. And, uh, like how reliable is RDS? Because like I have a database that I just like talking to that, and like a database with that is like MySQL database. And mm -hmm. I just forgot about it for years. Yep. I just want to just like look at that. And if it was like that, then I would have Mm -hmm. It depends on what you mean by reliable. I mean, there are, it does like to take it down for upgrades and updates, and it does it inside of a maintenance window if you don't schedule one yourself in advance. If you're running data you really care about, have a failover strategy that you can wind up, by, it's a great excuse to test it. I mean, you're never going to get 100% uptime out of any single instance or even any single cluster. So having a degradation mode that makes sense is extremely handy for that. The, as far as whether it's reliable or not, for some things, yes. For others, no. It comes down to what you mean by reliable, what trade-offs you're willing to make. It's advantageous in that you generally don't have to pay people to manage all of the nuts and bolts of running a database. 
it can be expensive in the sense of you don't get to wind up tweaking some of those things you might otherwise want to configure. So for some workloads, it's not appropriate. For others, it's, it's a slam dunk as far as the right answer. I don't think that there's an easy yes or no on that. I also got some pushback on a, uh, the version of my slides of things, the services you need to know. Someone said RDS is one of them. I don't know. I feel like that's sort of on the fence. A lot of it is EC2 principles just with a database on top of it. Click, receive, manage, database. It takes their are failure modes. It takes an awful long time sometimes to promote a replica. It can take an incredible amount of time to instantiate, especially from a snapshot. I mean, I've had migrations where restoring from snapshot was three quarters of the entire duration of the downtime. It really all depends on your use case and on your model. Other great question, though. Yes. Right. And to be fair, there is an alternative to everything, which is I'm just going to run some instances on EC2 and provide it myself. The, I'm also a little bit tongue in cheek about things that irritate me and frustrate me and I wouldn't recommend using for the common use cases, but every single one of them has a use case that makes sense. If, and the problem is, is alternatives are going to depend greatly upon what it is that you need to do. If you're talking about, for example, Cost Explorer is a piece of crap, great. You could wind up massaging it into working. You could use Cloud Health, Cloud Ability, Density, Densify, Metrically, Cloud Checker, Cloud Conformity, Gorilla Stack, and there's probably seven more I'm forgetting who will sue me if they ever see this video. But there's a whole raft of offerings there. Which one is the best for your particular use case is going to depend upon a lot of things. Your risk tolerance, what you're willing to pay, how you wind up viewing this, who needs to view it. And going down that rabbit hole is going to vary. The, if the answer winds up being that, yeah, for what you're trying to do, this makes an awful lot of sense, yeah, I've used every one of those services. The reason that I can sit here and make fun of them is because I know them. I know how they break and how they irritate me. For some, there is no alternative. There is no CloudWatch alternative, sort of. I mean, you, can, you have to still have to use it to consume into a real monitoring system. But I don't think that there's any way to get that data from the environment without it. Not what well anyway. Great question though. It is. To be fair, I did a survey at the end of last year, and people were about 50-50 on Terraform versus CloudFormation. Nothing is perfect in this space. You're, you're not wrong, They're, especially now that it supports YAML, I know, personal preference. It's not a terrible direction. One of the things that irritates me the most about it is that there's no way to say, take this thing that I have built and now describe it for me in CloudFormation. It's, oh, you built this thing by hand. Great. Now throw it away and do it again. It's, what? That's awful. Why do I have to do it that way? But you're right. Describing what you have as it stands now with CloudFormation is a great first step. Whether you break them into separate VPCs on a per-service basis or not may make sense, may not. Increasingly, in some cases, to contain blast radius, you'll start seeing people put them into separate AWS accounts under an organization. Best practice is there to have a single account that has all your users in it and then let them assume roles into the other accounts to do the things that they need to do. Great audit logging, great security posture, a little bit more complexity, but you can give them tooling to, make, to minimize that. So that is an emerging best practice. Um, in a global sense, the best practices, and I hate these because it's, it's, it completely lacks nuance, is go with immutable infrastructure, and then you wind up with a screaming match between people who are talking about, oh, containers are the future. No, serverless is the future. What about serverless containers? And then everyone's unhappy. And I'm not willing to stake that out yet. It's easy for me to stand here and say, oh, yeah, don't use Chef, don't use Puppet, don't ever configuration management things. Immutable infrastructure all the way. 
No one does that. There's always a pet somewhere. It's usually the build server, but I've seen other ways around that too. Like Jenkins, yeah, if your Jenkins winds up getting uh, blown away and you have to rebuild it from scratch, yeah, your code is not going to prod today. It's, I mean, that's always one of the unicorns. It's, and, there, and I'm not even saying it's a bad thing necessarily. I don't love it, but it's, I accept the reality of it. I, there are business constraints and reasons things are the way that they are, and there's always eventually going to be a pet somewhere. Heck, all of our laptops, by and large, tend to be run like pets rather than like cattle. Yeah. Yeah, which is awesome. If you can get there, yeah, that's a pattern a lot of folks are using. I wind up with the, um, I mostly tend to stay away for a lot of my use cases from auto scaling groups just because they wind up, oh, it's time for me to scale up. And they do right after I really needed them to have scaled up. It's one of those pre-warming issues of being able to anticipate load rather than react to it instantaneously. Serverless is a good story around that to an extent. Less so, but still there with containers. But it's one of these problems where it still takes a long time to take an AMI and instantiate that into a, uh, into a running instance relative to other things. When you have seconds to do it, it's not going to cut it. So there's always a, there's other trade-offs in all of these things. It's going to come down to use cases and how dynamic your environment is. If it's steady state static 90% of the time, then maybe being able to take those high level bursts isn't as critical for others. It's like similar to the problem when you used to be like, spell the name much. And then you have the configuration management system bleeding over to the orchestration system, and then it starts fighting with Terraform, and that's just awesome. Yeah. yeah. Kubernetes is going in that direction too, to a large extent. It's just, it, it feels like it's overly complicated. My problem with Kubernetes is not what it does, it's how it breaks. When it starts degrading, there are so many layers upon layers that where do you even start unless you can fit that entire stack of complexity in your head? I can't. So that's my opinionated stance on that one. But yeah, you're right. These are common ongoing problems. I also think we're over time at this point. I'm going to hang out here and suffer my version, throw my version of wit at anyone who approaches. Please, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time.